When writer and director Wes Craven's 1984 slasher film A Nightmare on Elm Street debuted, it shot to box office success as the resurgence of a genre that had dominated the early 80s before quickly wearing out its welcome. But thanks to Craven's psychological spin on the teen killer trope, Nightmare and its star Freddy Krueger, played by Robert Englund, became a box office smash for the then still burgeoning New Line Cinema. And so, what was once envisioned by Craven to be a one-off movie was quickly turned into a massive of franchise, leading to nine total films with seven made within the span of a decade, plus a TV show, but no one talks about that. The setup to the franchise was straightforward but effective in its insidious terror. Child murderer Freddy Krueger, or Fred as they called him in the original film, was killed by the vengeful parents of Springwood, Ohio after escaping justice on a technicality. But Freddy swore revenge and now haunts the dreams of teenagers in the town, killing them before they can wake up. And if you die in a dream, you die in real life. Forcing final girl after final girl to try and stop a killer that controls the very fabric of your dreams. The path to a massive franchise was also littered with many different sequel ideas that never made it to the screen. Some developed into full scripts, others little more than stubborn cast members wanting their shot at shaping the franchise that burned bright and flamed out fast. So, like we did last Halloween season with the Friday the 13th franchise, let's take a trip through the many unmade Nightmare on Elm Street sequels. This isn't so much an alternate sequel, but it's vital to talk about the original Nightmare on Elm Street briefly before we jump through history. Wes Craven's original script had a definitive happy ending, completely wiping away the threat of Kruger and giving original heroine Nancy Thompson total victory. But New Line Cinema founder Bob Shea demanded that the movie hit audiences with one final scare that could leave room open for sequels. As such, Craven filmed four different endings, one happy version and three other scary versions. Ultimately, shots from each version were used, leading to the confusing, dark ending and the very, very bad dummy jump scare. Craven never wanted to make a Nightmare sequel, but when he sold the script to New Line, he sold his rights to the property. Ultimately, New Line was gonna make Nightmare sequels whether he liked it or not. That led to part two, Freddy's Revenge, and Wes's off and on relationship with the franchise. <laughs> After part two was met with a mixed reception, several different ideas were floated for part three, including a pitch by Freddy himself. In this version by Robert Englund, titled Freddy's Funhouse, the sister of Tina Gray, the first person killed in the franchise, would come to Springwood looking for answers and revenge. The film would take on a more noir detective quality as the heroine looked for answers. Obviously, England's idea didn't get the green light, and instead Craven came back to the franchise to co-write what would become Dream Warriors, easily one of the best of the series and featuring that kick-ass Dawkins song. When Craven was brought back for part three, he was essentially beholden to New Line's whims regarding Nightmare. But that's all right, because he did it for the paycheck. I felt compelled to come back and expand the original concept, Craven said, and it was important for me in a business sense that I was able to negotiate a percentage point in the sequels I didn't have from the original film. Craven centered the film around kids separately traveling to the same place to die by suicide. This, of course, would be due to Freddy's influence on their dreams. Not surprisingly, Craven's original draft for part three was much darker, with the returning Nancy as the main character, searching for a way to destroy Freddy's house through the dream realm. It ends with Kirsten traveling back in time and killing baby Freddy, swinging his tiny baby body into a wall over and over. Yay! But the dark nature of the movie led to the film changing course. Rewrites by Frank Darabont and director Chuck Russell made significant changes and added in the fun Freddy that would slowly take over the series. After the success of part four, New Line went back to Craven for another idea. It didn't work out. His idea was illogical, said producer Sarah Risher. It was about time travel within dreams that broke all the rules of dreams. Instead, the studio went with a script that would become the Dream Master, and despite multiple rewrites, the screenplay was unfinished when shooting started due to a writer's strike. In the end, director Rennie Harlan and crew had to improvise dream scenarios on set to finish the movie. And you wonder why Craven had such a strange relationship with the franchise. 
In another of Robert Englund's sequel ideas, a new generation of children far removed from the original killings would be told the story of Freddy, with their imaginations causing each kid to develop their own nightmare version of the villain. So the urban legend of Freddy would be subject to how each person interprets horror, leading to many different versions of the same character. However, it's unclear if this idea ever made it further than a concept. As is the trend for any long-running franchise, horror or not, there's been more than one nightmare prequel idea floated around, this one being a script written by John Saxon in 1987, who played Lieutenant Thompson, Nancy's father, in the original Nightmare and Dream Warriors. Psst, they shouldn't have killed him off. This completely weirdo take on Nightmare would involve hippies, LSD, and the Manson family murders. Here, Freddy would have been an innocent victim framed for his crimes by a real-life serial killer Charles Manson, essentially giving no explanation as to why he became a serial killer in dreams. And the movie would have been titled, How the Nightmare on Elm Street All Began. John, I love you, but that's a terrible title and a terrible idea. This one never made it past Saxon's draft. At the start of the 90s, New Line was looking for a way to revive their flagging franchise. Nightmare 5 hit theaters one year after Part 4, with the studio kind of forgetting to write a script along the way. So the company turned to then up-and-coming director Peter Jackson. While Jackson is most famous for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, what Hobbit movies? Never heard of them. At the time, he was most famous for his gonzo splatter films Meet the Feebles and Bad Taste. In Jackson's Part 6, Kruger would be an old and worn-out shell of his former self, with local teens purposefully falling asleep to taunt and beat up the weakened, harmless villain. The idea would be a meta-reflection of how the series had lost its edge after five installments, and how Freddy had gone from frightening killer to that one family member you hate to run into during the holidays. That is, until Freddy manages to kill one of the kids, reigniting his rage and terror. Jackson's sequel wouldn't make it far, with New Line opting to follow the recent trend of marketing their film on the promise of killing off their fan-favorite character. The early drafts of Freddy's Dead would have the same general beats as the version that made it to the screen, but with some specific alterations. In an early version, the amnesiac John Doe teenager is specifically Jacob Johnson, the then unborn baby of the Dream Child. The film would also see the arrival of the Dream Police. Freddy's past victims trying to keep their killer under control in the dream world. Specifically, they would be the now-dead dream warriors, bringing back every fan-favorite character for a final hurrah. All of this was tossed out in favor of a movie that decides not to build off any ongoing mythology, in favor of sudden retcons, dream sperm, and 10 minutes of 3D, burying the franchise with all the enthusiasm of a dog half-heartedly kicking dirt over their own hot poop. Freddy's dead. Freddy's backstory was eventually revealed in full in Freddy's Dead, but there was briefly consideration of another backstory reveal in a nightmare prequel titled First Kills. The movie would take place entirely in the past and detail Freddy's criminal trial for his murders as a human, eventually leading to his exoneration and torching by the Springwood parents. But instead of being the typical slasher, First Kills would be a courtroom drama, with producers approaching director John McNaughton, the man behind Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, for the movie. If the idea of a Freddy movie that didn't have anything to do with the dream world and didn't have any, you know, slashing in a slasher franchise doesn't interest you, well, it didn't interest the studio either. This potential prequel didn't make it far past discussion. Did you know that during promotion for Freddy's Dead, New Line actually held a funeral for Kruger at the Hollywood Cemetery to promote the release? That was in bad taste. Anyway, Part 6 was built off the idea that the Nightmare franchise was well and truly over. But this is Hollywood and these things make money. So Bob Shea asked Craven to return, and his earliest ideas would have been a straight continuation of the franchise, with Heather Langenkamp's Nancy returning, possibly as the guardian of good dreams. However, Craven's meetings with Langenkamp and England led to the creator pursuing the meta-horror of New Nightmare, with the entire series being a franchise within the film, and the actors playing versions of themselves haunted by by a demon embodied by Freddy. In an early draft of this script, then subtitled The Ascension, Craven himself would drive cross-country on the run from Kruger. Desperately trying to finish his new nightmare script, and to stay awake, he would have cut his eyelids off. Pretty dark. Also, too much screen time for a non-actor. 
In my video on the Friday the 13th sequels, I did a fairly exhaustive rundown on the many different scripts that were never produced for the long in production Freddy vs. Jason film, so I won't repeat those here. Go check out that video if you're interested, it made many Friday fans mad when I made fun of the franchise. But there are a few I didn't cover. In the early drafts of the Freddy vs. Jason script by Damian Shannon and Mark Swift, recurring Friday the 13th hero Tommy Jarvis would have appeared. However, the character was cut in the rewrite for the sole purpose of making the movie as short as possible possible. Despite a sequel never happening, Shannon and Swift revealed that their plan for part 2 would have brought Tommy back, with the two writers still hoping to make a sequel someday. It's not gonna happen, guys. In more recent years, Warner Brothers considered a sequel to Freddy vs. Jason that would follow the characters of each franchise's modern remake, but the lack of fan enthusiasm for either movie and the general mess that is the Friday the 13th franchise rights quickly killed the idea. That about covers the rest of the Freddy vs. Jason movies that never happened. Also, in that Friday sequels video, I forgot to mention there was almost a found footage Friday movie after the reboot franchise stalled out. After plans for future installments in either franchise didn't happen after Freddy vs. Jason, it was inevitably time for a nightmare reboot, and as was the style at the time, the rights were snapped up by Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes. Like any franchise reboot, the 2010 movie was created with more movies in mind, so it's obvious that a sequel was at least discussed. Jackie Earl Haley, the new, grosser looking, harder to understand CGI dependent Freddy for the modern age, was under contract for more movies, but there was just one problem. Nobody liked that new movie. The reboot was actually fairly successful at the box office, but the poor reception from both fans and critics alike quickly cooled the idea for a sequel. The studio stalled on development, Haley's contract expired, and Wes Craven's estate regained the rights to the franchise after his death in 2015. <laughs> In the last few years, rumors have once again circulated that the franchise would receive yet another revival. This time, England advocated for someone else to fill the pizza face of Freddy, seeing himself as too old to play the role now. And his choice? Kevin Bacon, who had voiced interest in taking on the part. Of course, this doesn't mean that Bacon himself is actually in talks to take the role, simply that the two actors were interested in the decision. But the last time their interest was voiced was back in 2017, with the franchise not really moving forward in any real direction since. Craven's estate is now accepting pitches from creators who are interested in resurrecting the series. In recent years, multiple studios and creators such as Blumhouse Productions, who are behind the new Halloween movies, and Elijah Wood's Spectrovision, who have said they'd like England to return before moving the franchise on to a new incarnation, have expressed interest. And with the recent Halloween franchise revival making a lot of money, it's surprising that nothing has moved forward on Elm Street. In reviewing the franchise's history, it's interesting to note that there were fewer unmade Nightmare sequels than there were for Friday the 13th, most likely due to greater creative control over the franchise, and also due to New Line's super-fast run that drove the series into the ground in the span of five years. There's just not a lot of time for alternate movie ideas when Bob Shea is trying to get another Freddy movie in theaters as fast as possible. But there's still something frightening and compelling about a clawed killer who attacks you in the most vulnerable corners of your mind. And if we drift off to sleep, we may just see Freddy waiting for us, like he always has. Hey everyone and thanks for watching today's video. I know it's been a year since I did a video like this on the Friday the 13th franchise, but I figured I wanted to wait and make it a annual Halloween tradition to do something like this. I've always been more of a Friday the 13th fan than a Nightmare fan, but I had a lot of fun digging through the history of Nightmare on Elm Street, and it also gave me a chance to re-watch a lot of the movies for this. And overall, I think it's a really interesting exercise to see all the different possibilities that a franchise could have gone to, instead of what they eventually eventually did. And in the case of Nightmare, I feel like a lot of the alternate sequel ideas were interesting but not necessarily better than what the series actually ended up doing, although I do think there are a lot of bad Nightmare movies anyway. I am a fan of quite a few of them though. I would say that the original Dream Warriors and New Nightmare are awesome and I really enjoy them a lot. And Nightmare 2 Freddy's Revenge is pretty interesting given all the subtext of that movie. Anyway, this is the official start of the Halloween season on my channel, so expect 
expect lots and lots of horror-related videos in the coming months. No hints as to what's coming next, but it's going to be a very eclectic month of horror-related videos. As always, thank you to my patrons for continuing to support me, it means the world to me. I hope that you're all doing well, getting into the Halloween spirit, staying safe, and taking care of one another. I'll see you again soon.